good everybody. Um, sitting down with Billy Tossi, who has just some, started something on YouTube and Facebook, which uh, I'm absolutely pumped about. He's mixing in uh, hunting with cooking, and it's part of the reason why I love hunting or, or try to get good at hunting, I think, <laughs> so that I can be closer to my food. But, mate, I always start the podcast with what did you do on the weekend just been, because often that taps into a few passions. What have you been up to, man? Yeah, well, um, yeah, thanks for having me on, Ron. Um, in the weekends, uh, we actually went down to Wellington and and watched uh, the ABs, um, although probably should have been out, <laughs> should, have, should have been out hunting. A uh, pretty frustrating game to watch, but um, but no, it was pretty cool to be in a packed Westpac stadium and um, pretty passionate South African supporters sitting around us. So, uh, so no, it was good fun. Um, it's always nice to go to an All Blacks game, so so no, it was good. Um, but yeah, apart from that, uh, pretty quiet weekend uh, in terms of getting out there. It was um, probably the one weekend where um, the weather was pretty good, <laughs> so missed out on a, an, op- an opportunity because uh, it's pretty rubbish this week and and looking at, looking into this weekend as well. So, but yeah. no, it was uh, so. Did you uh, manage to catch the game at all? No, we've, we've just moving out here, um, back from back from Australia. We, we haven't had a television for ages. And then with a wee girl, it's kind of bedtime around seven. And I was just sort of gently check, tracking it over over on social media. Yeah. And you say about the week, the weekend for this weekend, um, I, I was having a quick look at it. And it's a lot better over my side of the ranges than your side it of the ranges. Is. It's, it's quite it, amazing. It, is actually. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny, actually, because... Um, because yeah, me and a couple of mates we'd um, we'd actually planned heading out this weekend, and um, yeah, everywhere apart from the Hawks Bay looks pretty good. So we're trying to frantically trying to reschedule and see if we can work out some spots <laughs> over on the Hawks Bay. But um, but yeah, uh, yeah, you're pretty lucky this weekend. You might be able to get out. Yeah, so I, I was supposed to be going to a, a conference up in Auckland this weekend, which got postponed. So. I had to yep. sort of flip a coin whether I move the flights to Saturday and, and just go up there for the night or, or go hunting for the night because um, drop my drop my wee, wee daughter and my partner off at the airport this morning and and um, oh. yeah, bat- batching for the weekend and so, but um, I'm going to take oh. the opportunity so yeah looking at that uh, weather forecast I was like oh is this going to be a good idea but we, we managed to avoid it being flats going around us which would be awesome yeah yeah. yeah. Well, there's a couple of, um, I mean, th- this morning, just looking at the Rohini's on this side, it's um, got a little bit of dusting and snow on top as well. So, um, so it should be pretty cold up there this weekend, if, yeah. uh, if anyone can get out there. Hopefully that means the uh, animals come down to where we're going. So that'd, that'd be good. Yeah, yeah. You, might have to, you know, <laughs> won't have to walk too far. Mate. Yeah. Mate, and, um, it, it could be sort of motivation to get up in the Rohini's pretty hot hot fast because I saw that there's a planned drop and a good appear a good amount of the Rohini's coming up. So it might yep. be um tough tough hunting up there. Is there much of a response in your community going on around there? Uh yes and no way. It's um I, I guess I mean I love hunting in the Rohini's. It's sort of that challenge, isn't it, of um public land, um, you know, really working hard for to to get an animal. Um Yes, the Rohini's probably don't have the reputation of, um, you know, big stags, but, you know, you, you hear the odd story of someone pulling out a really nice 12-pointer and I guess the 12-pointer in the Rohini's sort of, you know, is probably worth a couple more couple more points on top. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it depends. Eh? Um, uh, certain areas, um, you know, probably get, get looked at a little bit more than others and, um, and, and certainly different times of the year as well. Um, I mean, it's just it's just handy for us here in the Manawatu too, just to have such amazing hunting, you know, on on your back doorstep, really, um, and multiple sort of accesses, um, you know, so you can sort of go and in, in, into different areas, um, you know, on different occasions, and and you know have have different experiences all through it so um yeah i mean i've i've always sort of hunted the rohini's and parts of it and um you know along with sort of private private blocks as well um that borderline it so pretty pretty sport for choice really 
Yeah, I guess that's one of the great things about Manawatu is you can go south to Tararua's, Rumutaka, Rohini, up to Wanganui National Park, uh, take your pick. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're pretty, yeah, and, and it's funny because I was, I was speaking to a guy today who, um, you know, pretty much highlighted that exact that exact point, um, you know, with hunting and, and Manawatu, we, we, we are pretty lucky because we can sort of, um, you know, we're not too far away from anywhere. Um, you know, if we wanted to head over to your neck of the woods, it's, you know, um, an hour, an hour and a half drive and, and we're into some pretty good country. So we can sort of, um, you know, we can sort of be quite picky in terms of, um, weather and and um, you know different locations as well uh, and like you say you know we can head over to the west and, and head over to Wanganui and some awesome sort of pig and fellow fellow deer country over there as well so we you have the luxury of sort of um, you know targeting different species which is you know what I quite like now in terms of hunting is 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 um, you know the variety that that, that it can bring. No, I got disappointed in myself. I didn't, didn't uh, get into hunting until my early 20s. Growing up in Southland, I definitely missed an opportunity of uh, yep. access to lots of, lots of great country. Mate, where did, where did hunting start for you? Yeah, so for me, um, obviously grew up on a farm. Uh, Dad, Dad was a farmer and, and for all of his life, and um, you know, we were thankful um, that some of the farms he worked on um, you know, there was a bit of hunting involved as well. Um, and probably one farm in particular that sort of kick, kick-started it for me was over in the Wanganui area, uh, working on a pretty big station up the Wanganui River. And, um, you know, we were, we were pretty lucky and pretty sport really with um, the hunting. And, and that's where I guess I grew a passion for it even more so um, than, you know, what I did when I was a little kid. Um, for me, you know, it was always granddad, you'd go out with him and um, go rabbit shooting and, and you'd start off with small game um, and then he'd sort of give you the opportunity to, to go out and, and, you know, hunt for goats and, and then, you know, in my teens sort of then really started getting into hunting deer and, and, and sort of larger game as well. Um, and probably around the time where I really started getting into that, um, you know, deer hunting and, and pigs and, and things like that. It was um, where we had the opportunity with, you know, mum and dad moved to a farm up the Wanganui. So it was perfect timing, really. And um, yeah, we we had fellow deer and pigs running around. I mean, it was, um, you know, you can imagine, you know, a farm of thousands and thousands of acres. Um, and a lot of it is is bush and, and native bush and gorse and and things like that and and when dad took over the farm um you know there was a huge problem with with wild 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 game sort of affecting the farmlands and and so the the first thing was to sort of you know control it a little bit um and not let it overrun the farm um and um you know those were some pretty exciting first couple of years living living on the farm and um you know just hundreds of pigs everywhere um and and deer you know, it was, you'd go out and you'd be back within 10, 15 minutes with, you know, a nice deer and, and, and meat. And, and, um, so yeah, well, for me, it's sort of just, it's always been part of life really, uh, as a, as a kid growing up on a farm. And I think, you know, most, I guess, young people, um, you know, guys or girls that get the opportunity to grow up on a farm, I think that's sort of, it's a different aspect than, than to someone that maybe might have not had that opportunity. Um, and, you know, for me, I was fortunate enough to be able to, you know, go out after school and, and, and do things like that and, and um, you know, really find a passion for it. And, um, yeah, it just sort of, it's always been part of life, really. So um, that's sort of why sort of kick, kick started Wild Meat Hunter off um, early this year. Nice, mate. So... How's how's your sort of lifestyle geared now? Is, is you know, there's yeah. a lot there's a lot of life that gets in the way of, of going out for a hunt, and especially if it means going for a walk into yep. a national park. Obviously, those 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 good friends on, on farms are, are hugely valuable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. Look, it's one of those things, isn't it? It's um, and I guess for for me, I was I was pretty lucky as well because Dad um, not only um, you know made friends with a lot of a lot of farmers and and so we were 
uh, pretty fortunate to have family friends who owned farms and who had hunting or, or fishing and, and then he became a stock agent and then so he's going all over the country and, and he's got contacts. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things like public hunting and private farm hunting, um, it, it, completely different ball game. Um, and, and obviously, um, you know, I don't see any sort of negative or positive between either. Um, I prefer both of them. Um, you know, if I've got the opportunity to hunt private blocks, <clears throat> then great. I'll give it, you know, I'll get out there and do it. Um, but at the same time, I love getting out on public land and the challenges that that brings as well. Um, because, you know, with private blocks, um, you're not always guaranteed, but you know that there hasn't been a lot of pressure as, as what it would be in public public land. So, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just getting out there. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what, if it is private or public, it's just being out there and, and um, having the opportunity to hunt wild game is, is, um, is awesome. No, I so couldn't agree more. And yeah, I went out to the place I'm going on the weekend, uh, fortnight, on fortnight, three weeks ago. And, you know, even spooking and hearing deer is just like, oh, you know, gets the hair standing on end. And I guess that's because I'm a relative newbie, but all the same, it, yeah. it, you know, scratches the itch to keep out getting out there and doing and doing more and, and learning more. Um, I guess seeing a lot of game and seeing the characteristics gives you a good understanding of, of probably what to look for. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And um, like, I, I guess, and, and, you know, experienced hunters will probably say the same as well. You know, every time you go out, you're, you're experiencing something new um, mm. and you're running into something that you've never done before or, you know, you make a mistake or a cock up that you thought you'd never be able to do. And, um, and it's just, you're always learning things like, I mean, for me, it's, it's, you know, yes, hunting is, is an aspect where I love getting out there and doing it. Um, I don't always go out there with the intention of killing an animal. Um, you know, even if I just see something, it's, it's awesome. Um, for me, it's, it's, you know, meat, um, you know, foremost, um, first of all, um, and, and then, you know, after that, if it's if if it's a trophy or if it's got some size to it or age to it, then then you know that's that's great as well. So, um, yeah, I think it's just a case of getting out there and experiencing. It. And I guess for you know, like you say, you've you've obviously just new new to hunting, and um, you know, obviously there's a lot of people out there who are who are feeling new to it as well. And it's it's just that experience of getting out there. You know, it's it's something that's quite hard to explain um, to people that have never experienced it before, I think. And, you know, I've taken mates out who are probably some of the most um, non-hunters and city slickers that you'll ever meet. And, um, you know, they come away from a day walk or a day hunt just absolutely blown away and, and they want to get out there and do it again and they can't stop talking about it um, because it's that whole experience that they've just encountered, you know, being out in the hills and, and maybe seeing a deer or, you know, being lucky enough to put one on the deck is, um, you know, it's just a different perspective on 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 um, you know, getting into the outdoors. Yeah, I think it, it appeals to a lot of meaning. I was talking a few weeks back with a, with a guy about, you know, what are you doing this weekend? Back to back to my first question, and I said oh, I'm going for a hunt. And you know, if you you look at it on fundamentals, it's it's um, walking in the dark uh, down 150 meters elevation to climb back up it again. Um, sweat, sweat your heart out, then get freezing cold, then walk around in the bush, possibly get lost for a bit. Um, and if you do have success, then you've got to carry the bloody thing out of there um, and make that uh, yeah. 150 elevation even worse for yourself. But hey, looking back, looking back on a time of being absolutely drenched and, and, and soaked with the sweat from trying to, you know, carry and put yourself against nature, looking back on it, you just go, "Oh, that was so much fun! I want to do it again." But you break it down yeah. as a, you know, people might look. You know, people do look at you and go, well, "What would you do that for? How, how's that fun?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, yeah, it's just it, it, like I said earlier, it's quite hard to explain. And um, you know, when you when you're in the moment, but it's just one of those things that I, I guess for you know anyone listening, if they haven't had an opportunity to go out hunting, you know, get alongside someone who who does and 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 give it an opportunity because it's, um, you know, it it just it showcases. Um, 
you know, I guess how lucky we are here in New Zealand with, um, you know, the amount of bush and, and wildlife that, that you see um, when you're out hunting. And I guess it's also when people think about hunting, uh, let's just talk about hunting for first and foremost, when people think about hunting, it's, uh, I guess outside of hunters, cause hunters can relate to it quite well. But when people think about hunting first and foremost, they think killing and killing animals. Um, but they don't understand the preparation that's involved in it and the amount of time that's spent in getting to that point of, uh, potentially hunting a deer as well. Um, you know, you could be spending three or four days, um, you know, no food um, in the back blocks or back country, snowing, cold, wet. Um, but you've sort of really had to really, you know, challenge yourself mentally and also physically uh, to get through it. And, you know, the reward at the end of it is, you know, coming out with, with those sorts of memories. And, and if you manage to get a deer on the, on the deck as well, well, you know, that's just, an added bonus i guess mm. and it goes to what you were saying about your motivation some of the best healthiest meat available that you know is is lives possibly it's its greatest life and, and i guess the other aspect of, of hunting is being aware that you know sometimes even in our country with our predators some of those deer don't live don't live the best life and that's kind of you, you yeah. spoke about the farm that you went on that was sort of overrun and and, and and that's plenty of the challenges out there with, with our forests is perhaps there are some yeah. areas that are a bit overrun and the management needs to happen. And and whilst us as hunters make a, a small impact, we do make an impact and, and that, that's why the likes of 1080 and helicopters and stuff are, are out there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I look, I think, um, you know, they're probably, and, and I think the biggest, I think it was on uh, one of the other podcasts, um, that I was listening to as well, um, you know, how, how the hunting community came together uh, with regards to the tar, um, you know, issues that we had earlier on this year, I think it just goes to show how much of a voice hunters actually have um, for instances like that. And, but it sort of needs to be highlighted more often um, and not just brought to, I guess, the surface when, uh, something major happens like it needs to be consistent and constant I feel and you know 1080 I mean it's just I don't know what your opinions are Ryan but for me it's just probably taking out probably too many um, of our natural wildlife um, you know compared to what the goal target of of the government and, and DOC are actually <coughs> achieving um, there could be other ways that um, that it could be managed, um, and if we have those opportunities of maybe uh, looking into those ideas, then you know who knows. Let's let's give it a go. But yeah, I mean, it's just there could be there could be other ways, in my opinion, that you know we we control animals and um, the the positive side to it as well. You know, it gives other people opportunities um, to get out there and and hunt, um, potentially make a living from it as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'd be interested to hear your views in terms of what you think around that. Yeah, and, and, and for, for me, having a keen interest in, in actual deer farming as well, you sort of can see when the price goes up, the, the economics for yeah. the likes of um, actual recovery start to make sense. And I, I, I'm sort of okay with with the likes of Waro, if it's going into a market sort of thing, you know, yeah. th those guys have got to got to pay the bills to get in the air. But yeah. for actual, you know, for the likes of the tar, where this sort of it was just out and out slaughter to be planned, and then yeah. uh, just just before I jumped on here with you, I saw that um, a, a number of pages on on Facebook had shared the Molesworth report um, into the effects that 1080, 1080 had on the deer population and pig population on that station yeah. after that, that drop, I think, a couple of years ago. And whilst not getting to, to read the whole whole lot, looking at the headlines, it's it's not great. And, and, and exactly that, you sort of think, is, is, this, the, is this the aim? You know, um, mm. sure, sure, the deer affect the, the sort of the, the ecology for the birds and stuff and, and you know, like I said, when you're out hunting and you're exposed to it, you know what to look for. And more and more, 
sort of start walking mm -hmm. along going, oh, I might be in the right place now because dear have an impact and that's obvious. Um, but, it, you know, like I said, there's, there's got to be another way. And, and unfortunately, I think in the case of 1080, there's so much caught up in that enterprise that, you know, it's, it's yeah. like a bull to a red rag. They're, they're, they're keeping on going and, and the people behind it are keeping on trying to keep the message positive and keep, you know, keep the cash cow going, I guess, which is... Yeah, which is but bit, there's no other... There, yeah, and there's, well, there's no other plan. There's no other substitute for it. Yeah. Um, whereas if they if they'd put in a plan and and said okay well you know let's develop something over a long long term period as opposed to a quick fix uh, and in my opinion 1080 is a quick fix because there's no other there's no other plan B um, so if they can come up with something that you know they implement now but they don't start to see the effects of that over you know two three even five years time then in five years time they can slowly start to minimize the amount of use of 1080 um, but in my eyes they just don't have a plan b in terms of okay well if we stop 1080 what do we do then um, mm. because yeah if i mean if they stop 1080 yeah they, you know we're going to have a controlling issue um, but then who controls um, there's 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 no sort of there's no balance in terms of um, you know, how do we eradicate pests? Um, how do we uh, control deer population? Um, there's, there's none of that in terms of, okay, well, in five years' time, this is where we want to be. And when we get there, um, then, you know, we will minimise the amount of use of 1080. Um, at the moment, it's just we're going to do 1080 drops and that's it. Uh, and in my eyes, that's just not the right way of going about it. Yeah. And... Um it's, it's kind of like a okay, matter what, what's the goal is it to you know minimize it or are we trying to solve a problem and, and we, we as a management thing for pests especially the, the goal the goal is zero one one because they they're devastating and two they carry diseases well that, that's at least the motivation of of osprey is to, to stop ten, uh, tb going around but yep. if, if we're really trying to get rid of this oh you know I've only sort of been following it maybe 10 years and it doesn't seem like the outcome is we're getting rid of it. it it's that, you know, this year there might be a big, you know, beach, beach mast. And so we need to kill a lot of, of rats so that they don't eat them all up. But, you know, at, at what cost and, and, and at what down long-term success do, do we get? What is the, you know, like you're saying, what is the long-term success of all that? And then I guess yeah. in, in terms of the deer and, and it's something that the guys in Educated Hunter have spoken about lots of times, it's you know it's all very well us all having certain types of opinions but we're all going out there with our personal missions at the moment to you know to justify that we're shooting a best um yeah yeah, yeah. But really our motivation yeah. is probably meet in the freezer and, and like say maybe maybe going for yeah. some tro trophies <laughs> but if there can be some sort of plan and, and plan takes money and, and takes um yeah. takes monitoring and takes enforcing but if there can be some sort of plan to minimize the herd minimize the, the the effect but also keep the quality of hunting well then that's a positive it's just just a matter of like i say there's not enough people to, talking about it ongoing to yeah. make, make it worthwhile and to bring it to fruition well and that's the thing um and i mean for me you know for me as a young fella i was um you know uh, out of school you know was out in the bush trapping possums, uh, working for a contractor in Taranaki trapping possums. And as, as a young guy, you know, it was awesome. Um, you know, that's your job. You're out in the bush, um, you know, 12 hours a day, setting traps, checking traps, um, plucking fur, um, you know, setting bait stations. Um, you know, for me, that was just life experience that, you know, looking back now, I'm, I'm so thankful I got the opportunity to do that. Um, Whereas the, uh, for me, uh, I don't know. I just, I just feel like there's, there's not enough of that now. Um, and you know, if there was the opportunity for young guys or even girls to get out there and do that um, for a year as work experience, it would just set them up um, for life experience skills um, that potentially uh, they don't, they won't experience if they live in the city. Um, you know, going forward on on whatever they want to do in their life. Um, you know, it's just it's it's little things that you that you learn about yourself when you're out in the bush on your own. 
um, you know, it's the mental challenge that you have to go through. It's the physical challenge as well. It's um, saying to yourself, you know, can I, can I do this or can't I do this? Uh, pouring down with rain, you're lost in the bush, where do I go? It's all those types of things that, you know, as a young person, if you're able to overcome those sorts of things, then, you know, it sort of gives you the confidence to move forward in life where, um, you know, now modern society, it's, it's, it's a world of technology. Uh, it's a world of, you know, things that probably are more prevalent than hunting or the outdoors, um, you know, and, and it's not unless you know someone whether it be family or a friend who's really keen on it or who has a farm that you're actually going to experience some form of outdoor pursuit activity um, because it's just not really driven all that much. Um, so I think, you know, if, if there was opportunities for, you know, pest control to be incorporated into um, schools where um, they learn about um, how to, I guess, become more involved in conservation on a pest controlling side of things and actually get them involved. Um, you know, that could, that could be a plan. That could be something that, um, you know, with every secondary school in New Zealand, you know, if they did a one year um, sort of course for people who are keen to get in the outdoors and actually contribute towards pest control. Well, there's, you know, a pretty large number of people that, that could help contribute towards conservation and controlling pests um you know right off the bat so and i and i can guarantee you that there would be some pretty keen and eager um young people you know boys and girls uh and second girls that would be pretty interested in something like that absolutely and mate, in my line of work we're seeing people from you know eight-year-olds 10-year-olds 12-year-olds 15-year-olds 16-year-olds in schools just really getting on top of them and and the stress and expectation of it all, you know, a moment to be out and be free, I think would do the world of good. And, you know, we were, um, a colleague of mine, we were discussing a case today about a young girl who's second last year of school, private school, and just the, the amount of stress and, and anxiety that's on top of this poor girl. And, and, you know, she needs she needs a break and she can't wait till she finishes school to have a gap year. Well, imagine if, if we could, you know, implement something like this as a, as a program. And, you know, you just got to look back a couple of months to when as New Zealand school kids were marching in the streets for the environment. Well, you know, they're, they're keen and eager, like I say, keen and eager. Here's an opportunity to get in touch with it and also probably bring about more of an understanding. You know, the urbanisation of our society has removed us from, from the bush. And, and like even for myself, going into the, the Kawikas for the first time and seeing the amount of pine that's in amongst the native, I was just like, oh, this is bizarre. You know, not many people would, would realise that. And, and I've been watching a few more Kawika videos and pines everywhere and you go, oh, yeah, this is not not just the McKinsey country, not just Central Otago that's got this yeah. problem. It's, it's all over New Zealand. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there there are, you know, I guess there can be opportunities. There can be ways that we can... Um, you know, do things differently. Um, but like you say, it's, 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 you know, we've got to come together as a community, um, as a hunting community, because we're the ones that, you know, probably we sit behind a computer um, and we rant about uh, 1080 being dropped everywhere, but we don't really sort of stick up and come together or, or voice our opinions um, with regards to how we can actually make it or make a change. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I guess for me, you know, like you talked about with, with stress and, 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 and you gave the example of the young girl, you know, I mean, for me, that's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a balance in terms of, it's a life balance for me getting out in the outdoors as well. Um, you know, I work in a sort of an industry that, that can be quite stress related. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, in your line of work, it could be the same as well. And getting out in the outdoors is, is just, you forget about everything. You know, there's no cell phone coverage. There's, um, you don't have to worry about all the, the dealings or the worries of the world because um, your focus, your 100% focus is uh, in the moment of being either out in the hills or, you know, on the water fishing or, you know, out diving. And, um, you know, you come back and you feel, and you feel, you feel re-energized and, and um, you know, it's, it sets you up for, you know, another week. And, um, you know, for me, it's always been, 
um, you know, a, a good way to release pressure um, and, you know, just to sort of balance my lifestyle and, and, and refocus if, if I'm feeling fairly down or, or down and out. And um, I know that, you know, a day in the hills will, will set me up for, um, for a wee while as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just continuing on that coming coming together message. What what do you think the response is um, for the NZDA over your side of the hills? Um, I, that was sort of something that Mick Gibson and I talked about. Is that you know to be the voice, we've got to actually have have names on the page. And and when it comes yeah. to the NZDA and versus the amount of hunters, the names aren't on the page, and and that, so therefore the collective voice isn't there. And that was the motivation as soon as I came back to New Zealand was to join up after after the tar thing how's it sort of going over over there in the middle too yeah it's it's probably fairly similar as well um you know you, you'll have a small group of people um which is which is great um you know it's it's always nice to have more and and, and more of a voice um especially younger people um because I guess if we can introduce younger people coming through as well, um, they've got the energy, um, they've got um, the ability to to share their experiences with different communities and, and age brackets as well. Uh, but you're right, it's it's about um, you know engaging other people and uh, getting them involved. And you know, I mean, the whole point of um, you know why why I started Wild Meat Hunter was was not only um, to share my journey in, in terms of the outdoors and, and hunting, fishing, and diving, and um, showcasing the cooking aspect of it, um, you know, which we'll touch a little bit on later, but but more so around you know one conservation and and understanding how it all works a little bit more, and and having people voice their own opinions through you know my feeds and 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 sharing their experiences and how we can do things better as well. Um, you know, in a, in a very short space of time, you know, I've had people call and, and message me, um, you know, with, with ideas on how to do things. And and it's just great being able to hear different people's points of views. But it would be nice if we could, you know, take that to the next level um, and, and really gain some traction around uh, certain areas that, um, you know, New Zealand Deer Stalkers Association need assistance with or... Um, you know, doc, how could we change things with regards to pest control or, or things like that? Um, so it's about certain people coming together, and, and you know, I, I listened to that podcast with you and Matt, and you know, I think he's spot on with regards to you know, political views. And, and um, you know, we've got one person sitting at the top making their own uh decisions that just you know, it, it's I mean, you can see why some hunters and that get pretty frustrated, mm. yeah, and. and <clears throat> it was, it was, we also talked about the fact that um, Doc, Doc and NZDA, you know, we need to put our differences aside. And, and Matt, Matt said that yes. for all the right reasons, there's many people that have been stung by Doc and stung by Waro in the past and, and have a, yep. you know, a distaste <clears throat> for that. But, you know, I, I put up last week the Hawks Bay NZDA went up and did, did a possum line, and, and I can't wait to get along with them and, and do it. And that's the sort of yep. message that we need to get out. and um, I saw the the Seeker Foundation partnering with Good Nature to do a line and, and make sure the Fio up in the Kaimano is a are doing all right and you know they're amazing birds to see in the wild even if they do sort of let, let the basin know that you're there but yeah and, and in the field and Wapiti Foundation as well doing great work with Kiwi and and um, yeah and in the Fio as well so I, you know. Like I say, it's just about getting getting our voice and getting more people talking, and and, and yeah, as, as yeah, you're... and just and community community involvement, I think as well. Um, um, you know, would be nice. Um, you know, Doc do a great job, and and you know, you know, they 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 sort of, I guess for for many people, they do a lot of work in behind the scenes that you probably don't see or, or hear about, and and you know, the one the one thing that they do do, they get you know, crucified for. Um, so, you know, th they protect and, and they do a lot of good stuff. Don't get me wrong, Docker, amazing. Um, and it would be, um, you know, I mean, here in the Manawatu, too, um, it, it would be nice to hear a little bit more about their community involvement. Um, you know, we don't really hear of um, you know, activities or events that, you know, they might 
they might be doing a possum line, you know, they might be releasing fish into the river or birds or things like that. And it would be really cool to really publicize that, um, you know, locally um, to get more involvement, uh, to get people out there and, and seeing it and get people engaged in it. Because I think if people get engaged in it, um, then they become interested in it. When people become interested in it, then they start to voice their own opinion. And that's when you build up a community of people's viewpoints and opinions. And, and that's when you sort of really start to, you know, get some traction around what is, you know, what is right and, and how we can make a difference. Um, so it, it would be nice for those sorts of organizations to really start to put it out there for communities and regions to really note and, and take heed to what they're actually doing. Um, I think that would be, in my opinion, a really good start to coming together. Because like you say, you know, you've got to put your differences aside um, and it's about working together to be able to come up with, you know, an end result that works for everyone. And, and if, um, you know, if they can uh, involve people more, uh, then people might understand what, what their purpose is and, and what they're trying to get across. So, but if they don't do that, then people are just going to assume. And then that's why they continue to get crucified. So, um, you know, it's, it's just a case of, for me, it would be nice to see them, um, yeah, more community involvement and, um, you know, getting people out there and, and involved in what they're doing. Yeah. And that may be a case of the fact that we we'll go back to the politics of it all that, so the forest and bird have, have taken a monopoly on, on bird life and, and tree and, and at the same time have isolated a lot of people and, you know, not, nothing against the Green Party there, there as well, uh, just the fact being sort of in power at the moment, they're also a minority party and, you know, when you take two, two minorities and they take a monopoly on, on the welfare of, of New Zealand conservation, that is sort of isolating to everybody else. And like I say, has a slightly different viewpoint of it. And it may be part of the reason why we don't hear anything about tree plantings and and uh, wetland, you know, sort of reclaiming, which, funnily enough, many farmers are doing now, and, and collective collective units of farms are, are, are really sticking it in for the for the waterways and, and that sort of stuff, and reclaiming yeah. wetlands and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I think there's there's plenty of examples of of that being a good job, but again, not being publicised. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So how did you, how did you how did you get into hunting? How did you get into hunting, Ron? Well, I was um, put the question back on you. Sorry, mate. Yeah, we've sort of had a, a, a twenty-two in the family for for a long time, and, and I believe it was going back even further than that. And, and my old man, um, a bit like you, is lucky enough during high school and, and university holidays to go work work on a farm in Waikai. And, and the same with his father; they had an association with distant relatives down there, and he's from Dunedin, so. You know, he did a little bit of pest control and environment and the odd deal with, with the old farmer. But yeah, it was just one of those things that sort of sat in a cupboard that we didn't know where it was or, or where the key was or anything like that. And the odd one or two acres, the odd rabbit or magpie that'd be on the on the front lawn would get get rid of. And, and same going up, up to Wanaka to go camping would bring 22 with us and, and knock on a farmer's door and clean up a couple of rabbits. But that was really it for a long time. And you know, my, my girlfriend asked me as well, you know, why, why am I obsessed with deer farming and hunting and stuff? And I, I just really didn't, don't know. It's probably growing up in Southland and, and having that, those sort of stories yeah. around. And yeah, by the time uni came around, I just sort of thought, you know, once this is over, I'm going to get into it. But I was play, playing rugby pretty seriously. So it's just been very inter intermittent. And, and now the yeah. boots, are, boots are hung up and, you know, it only takes an hour to get to the Kawekas or... or 40 minutes to get down to my mate's place in Tokokino. Um, nice. Yeah, I'm keen to, you know, get the freezer full and, and yeah, feed, feed, feed the family with, with wild game would be, be fantastic. So yeah. that, that's that's where I'm at. And then I've got a massive passion for food as well, like yourself. So that was yeah. when we, uh, I saw you, your page and what you're doing. It really resonated. Where does where your sort of passion for cooking and, and culinary um, flavours come Yeah, from? it's one um, of the problems I with guess... wild game, eh? Some people... Do, you know, don't yeah. know what to do with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's it, you know, it's sort of, the, and, and, and that's what you, you can sort of get into that um, thinking, you know, you, you, you stick to the same old things, you know, you, 
you take the, the the venison to the butcher and get it made into sausages and meat patties and or sort of salamis and and don't get me wrong it's uh, beautiful but there's so many other you know cool and and different things that you can that you can think up and and utilize the meat in different ways and and you know that's sort of what I want to um, try and get across is is um, you know in, in in all the videos that I you know hopefully can get across to people is hey look you know I'm just not out there to showcase uh, me um, out there killing um, animals um, you know I've, I've got a purpose for doing it I'm doing it to harvest wild game and wild meat and I'm going to show you how to utilize the meat that you know we end up harvesting whether it be um, deer pigs fish you know shellfish um, there's so many different ways that you can utilize it um, you know whether it be you know quite fancy whether it be quite um, hearty um, whether it be quite out of the box you know there's there's so many I mean cooking and food probably in the last five years has just gone ballistic um, and so many people are you know just so interested in food and cooking it's unbelievable and so for me it was like well I love cooking um, you know I've always sort of loved cooking through my teenage years um, you know going to boarding school you sort of had to fend for yourself and cook for yourself <laughs> Uh, then going flatting is sort of like you know dad drops off a few uh, roasts and and mum comes in and cooks and stuff so um so yeah you know like cooking has always been a part of it and then you just sort of experiment and um you know you pick up new, new things and and learn new things and i think you know you can jump on internet now youtube and there's so many different cooking channels and you know there's some pretty amazing cooks come from New Zealand now who are doing some wonderful things where, you know, you can sort of utilize some of their things and, and, um, you know, just make it different in, in your own sort of, uh, way and experiment with, with different sort of ingredients and products, um, you know, which is really exciting. And, um, you know, for me, um, cooking while game, is, I mean, there's nothing better than, for me, in my opinion, uh, and I guess a little, it will resonate with a lot of hunters out there as well, is, um, you know, there's no better feeling than um, doing the hard yards out in the hills or out on the water. Um, you know, you've got a memory, you've got a story. Um, you then come back, you prepare an amazing meal, you sit down with friends and family, and you share that memory and story with them over the meal that you've just been able to create with the food that you've just been able to harvest. I mean, for me, that's just the ultimate. Um, and so, you know, that's where sort of Wild Meat Hunter NZ was sort of born, really. It was sort of like, you know, um, sitting around a table, having, you know, food that I'd been able to hunt and harvest and and being able to cook and prepare. and, and um, you know, it was sort of like, well, you know, this is what I love doing. I love hunting. I love fishing. I love diving. Um, also love cooking. So let's bring the two together and, and showcase that to, you know, people out there who who may love it. And, um, yeah, we'll just see how it goes. And, you know, I've had some pretty good feedback from a lot of people. And um, I guess it's just more relatable. Um, and, that, and that's what I've tried to make it is, you know, relatable to, um, not just hunters, but people who enjoy cooking as well. There's a different aspect to it because um, I know a lot of people probably don't like the whole aspect of the hunting side of things, um, which I totally understand. Um, but they may they may enjoy the dynamic of you know how to cook venison. Um, you know, if they're in a supermarket and they see some venison and they want to buy it, which I don't know why, but if you want to buy some venison in the supermarket and and you want to learn some recipes on how to cook it, then um, you know there's this is this is for you. Um, so yeah, for me, it's it's just more about um, you know taking people on a on a on a journey that that um, is a little bit different. Um, there's a lot of people out there who are doing some awesome things, and uh, you know with hunting videos and. You know the Hunters Club and NZ Hunter Adventures. I mean, you know, I love it. it I'm addicted to it. Um, you know, I've got it on series record on on my Sky, and I watch it over and over and over again. Um, you know, I'm never going to compete with those sorts of guys. However, um, I guess I've got a point of difference in terms of you know the culinary side of things and and relating to people um, on more sort of a 
hunting for meat aspect uh, as opposed to potentially hunting for trophy or uh, older animal um, you know type of hunting as well yeah mate <clears throat> you know you know you said about sitting down at the table sharing with it <clears throat> I've caught you caught you cold through the through the uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that, that's sort of what makes good art and good good music and, and good wine is the provenance of, of, of what what goes into it and that's what I love absolutely love about hunting and also about things like the venison industry so you know <clears throat> why would you buy venison at, at supermarket when you can get it off, off, off the um, off the hill but you know we're not all lucky enough to get it off the hill and it, yep. it about you know there is more to it than making it into salami and sausages and and somebody that's a massive sort of influence on me and, and i've been lucky enough to meet him is, is graham brown who who does some fantastic yeah. videos with, with duncan venison um and yeah just like like you know i saw, saw your um little uh venison chunks with with the sort of soy sauce and stuff and i was like oh that's that's sensational <laughs> yeah yeah it's just like you know people don't think you, you sort of it's quite hard sometimes to think outside the box in terms of different cuts of meat. And, um, you know, that's what I really want to um, get across to people is, you know, um, you know, some of the meat that we might just put in, you know, all into a bag and we take it to the butcher and get it put into mincemeat or, um, you know, we, we get it put into sausages or things like that. that you can do other things with it and it's just providing like a variety um, for people to think about and just say, oh, yeah, man, you know, next time I get a deer, I'm going to try that recipe and, and see how it goes. But, you know, I might not do it Villy's way. I might just, you know, because I don't like that way, I might do it this way, but I'm going to follow the sort of same sort of steps and processes and how we prepared that. You know, that's what I sort of, you know, I mean, that's for me, if someone, you know, sends me a photo of, of them cooking a recipe, that's awesome. You know, that's that's sort of what I want to hear. And, and, and that's the whole purpose of why I sort of wanted to get Wild Meat Hunter NZ up and running is, is you know, sharing sharing stories and sharing memories and sharing ideas and, and um, you know, bringing it all together with food. Um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty cool thing and pretty special. I mean, there's nothing better than sitting down with family or, or friends and, and um you know telling them about the stories of how you got the meat um and you know the types of cuts of meat that you've been able to use for this um it's 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 quite a i don't know it's it's quite hard to explain in terms of the satisfaction you get out of it um it, it's like anything you know if if you're if you have cooked a really nice meal and you've worked really hard to do it you feel satisfied when you sit down and other people just rave about it. You know, they're like, Oh man, this tastes so good. Um, you know, what did you put in this? You know, what sort of spice did you put in that? You know, it's just, it gives you, I guess, a hit of endorphins and, and you feel good about it. Um, you know, for me, it's exactly the same, you know, when I've been out hunting and, and being able to provide meat for the family and friends to take away and then being able to, uh, you know, cook them a really nice meal. Um, you know, it sort of makes you feel feel good um, that you've been able to provide for them and, and, and cook something that's pretty special. Yeah, mate. And what I'm absolutely loving is uh, barbecuing coming to New Zealand oh. in a different way. And like I said, yeah. John, John Dudley from, from Knock On TV and, and the rivets out of British Columbia, the, the stuff that they do. And, and like I said, the cuts, they, you know, Dudley does, does ribs all the time, medicine ribs. And I'm just, oh, yeah. That's another way of doing it, you know. Yeah. So just yeah, you know, yeah. A, a delicious backstrap. Instead of taking that off as a strap, making it into this sort of tomahawk-esque yeah. steak that you, oh, fantastic that you slow cook and yeah, amazing stuff. Well, it's even like a lot, a lot of, um, and and you know, this is the other thing I really want to showcase as well is, um, you know, certain things that get left in the hills as well. You know, um, we're all guilty of it. I mean, I put my hand up. You know, I've done it. I do it. Um, but it's being mindful of it, you know, take home some liver, kidney, um, or, you know, take a little hacksaw with you and cut out half of the rib cage and take that with you as well. Um, so that, you know, you're, you're mixing it up. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very conscious. My, my dad, he always said to me, you know, if you can't carry it out, then don't shoot it. And mm. I've always sort of, um, and it's always sort of resonated with me as well. Um, you know, very rarely would I, you know, only take back steaks out. Um, 
or you know behind legs i'd always at least try and carry out majority of the meat and um you know if i can only take the back legs and back stakes you know i'll, I'll also take some of the awful cuts as well um because you know to me it's just showing true respect for the animal that you've just taken and and you want to you know i guess give it she will show show respect for the animal and in, in the ultimate way and the ultimate way for me is utilizing every piece of meat that 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 you can harvest off it and um you know there's some amazing uh, i mean offer was just so underrated and um you know i love sort of although people turn their noses up may turn their noses up at it and and go a bit squeamish when you talk about you know cooking liver or kidney or heart or um you know things like that but man it's honestly some of the most tastiest pieces of meat um you know you'll ever try um but you know probably 90 95 percent of it gets left in the hills because we're only taking out back legs or back steaks so um you know i really want to um showcase you know to, to hunters out there to you know really give it a try and um you know next time you take an animal you know just take take the liver as well and and um, cook it up and you know, add it to your sausage mix or, or you know, if, if, if you're baking a pie, you know, um, you know, dice up some venison cubes and throw in some kidney and liver in there as well. And, and um, you know, you've got, you know, venison steak and kidney pie. So it's just thinking about different ways of being able to utilize the whole animal uh, and the carcass as opposed to just the ordinary cuts of meat that we're, that we're satisfied and sort of carrying out. Uh, it's probably... Uh, you know, I'm guilty of as well. You probably get a little bit complacent and a little bit lazy, and and um, and you know, for me, it's you know, I really want to you know, sort of showcase people that there are ways, um, you know, different types of cuts that you can you can really utilize in different ways. Yeah, and then make, making a good pate, and, and I've got a oh. recipe recipe um, there to make a. We we made a lamb roast last night, and. and <coughs> got some leftover meat to make a pie with and, and it's lamb and, and lamb kidney pie so you know you can e easily substitute most venison uh most, most lamb dishes for venison that's, that's for sure it's yeah yeah, yeah yeah absolutely yeah definitely but it's also other meats as well eh? like um you know like fish as well um yeah. you know not just taking off the fillets it's you know utilizing the whole body and and the heads and you know cooking broth and stock and um you know all that type of thing um you know, I really want to uh, get out there and, you know, small game as well. Rabbits and hares and, you know, the, there's, there's so many, I think we're, we're, like I said earlier in the podcast, we're so lucky here in New Zealand to have such a large variety of wild game that we've got generally in every region on our back doorstep. Um, you know, most areas will have public land access. Most areas will have farmland where most farmers are happy if you want to come down and, you know, hunt a couple of rabbits and take them home. Um, and, and most farmers are pretty happy, um, you know, doing a bit of pest control as well. Um, so we're pretty lucky. And, 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 and you know, small game is, is something that I'm, I'm really interested in and, and, you know, learning more about how to cook it, um, how to prepare it um and coming up with some pretty exciting recipes around that as well um bird waterfowl you know i guess in new zealand waterfowl you know we we think of ducks pheasants uh, canada geese uh, but there's other things like pigeon as well um you know there's a huge population of pigeon in new zealand um a lot of dairy farmers have uh trouble with pigeons in terms of eating grain and 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 you know silage you know on their silage pits and things like that um, so they get, you know, people come in and, and control them and, and um, but, you know, there's, there's some really tasty ways of being able to utilize pigeon meat as well. Um, so, you know, like things like that, it's, um, it's, you know, that's, that's probably what I really want to showcase in our, in our journey with Wild Meat Hunter NZ is, is not just your normal typical game um, hunting, you know, deer and, and pigs. Um, but sort of thinking outside the box in terms of the other game as well. Um, and, and really, you know, thinking of exciting recipes around it, things that people probably, you know, either will be like, Oh, I'm never trying that. Or, 
you know, that sounds really, really, really tasty. And I'm going to give that a shot next time I have, you know, some meat in the freezer or I get given some meat from friends or, or from family. You know, I'm really going to try that recipe. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not just um, big game, but definitely small game as well that, um, you know, really, really does interest me and, and waterfowl. Um, you know, duck shooting season's now over, but 2020 we'll be back into it again. And, um, you know, it'll be exciting to uh, to get stuck into some waterfowl and, and, and showcase how, uh, I mean, duck is just beautiful um, and pheasant. Um, so, you know, it'd be awesome to, uh, to uh, get some beautiful recipes around around uh, waterfowl as well. Yeah, and probably another thing people don't realise is the amount of turkeys and, and even peacocks yeah. that are out there. Yeah, the alpuki goes in, in certain areas yeah. as well. Um, you know, the breast, like I said about pigeon, the breast meat of pigeons just absolutely insane. Yeah, oh, and turkeys and, 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 and peacocks, like you said, man, they're just some of the most tastiest eating birds that you can have you know like in terms of flavor puts chicken breast to absolute shame yeah. um but it's just you know we're in, in our society we're just not used to it and and so we sort of put up some barriers around eating it um you know yep peacocks you know they're a very pretty bird um and they have beautiful feathers um but you know it's they they're also a very very tasty eating animal as well and you know most peacocks in new zealand are all free range that you hunt um so being able to go out and hunt free range uh bird and uh eat it and it tastes far better than a bought chicken breast um you know to me it's a no-brainer <clears throat> yeah, especially when those chicken breasts are all full of water mate um... oh, you know yeah. Yeah. Full of water and you don't know where it comes from. Yeah. How do you sort of feel about, you know, we we talk about hunting in terms of going out there, getting away for it. How do you sort of um, get your head around bringing the technology with you? Like when I walked out the other weekend, I, I took a couple of videos of myself and then I was like, oh, is this is this stupid or is this useful or what? Yeah. But then I just decided yeah. not to hear about it there anyway. But yeah, how do you sort of feel about taking the technology with you? Yeah, it's it's um it's a tough one, eh? Because it's something that I've had to really get used to. Um, last year, um, so our, our main camera guys. So there's a couple of guys that that are sort of coming along on this journey with us. Um, we've actually got quite a big team in behind the scenes, actually, um, and in certain areas that specialise in different things. So um, that's why I guess uh, when I started with Wild Meat Hunter, um, you know, I said to myself, um, you know, if I'm going to do it, I want to do it right. Um, you know, I want the videos to be shot really well. Um, I don't want anything to be done half-assed. Um, you know, I want them to look professional. I want there to be different angles. I want there to be different points of view that people can see <coughs> that really showcase, um, you know, the whole experience. Um, otherwise, you know, I can go out and get a GoPro and film it. And um, it wouldn't sort of really truly show my experience in trying to portray the whole hunt or the whole cook to someone. Um, so last year I sat down with a guy, uh, we were just talking over coffee. Uh, he did a bit of work um, uh, for me, you know, with me uh, in my, in my job. Uh, and, and we got talking about it and um, you know, we sort of said his, his real passion. So he's, he's a videographer and a photographer. So he's a professional videographer and photographer. His real passion was um, programming. Um, so, um, you know, really developing programs um, and video content to be able to piece together, edit and produce episodes or, or you know, uh, short films. Um, and he hadn't really had the opportunity to do that. Um, and I said, oh, okay, well, you know, I head out, I go out hunting a bird if you wanted to come along and just, you know, film some stuff, um, you know, to sort of increase your profile I'm more more than happy to do it. And we joked about it for a while and and um and then, you know, we sort of left it at that and and then um you know, some time time went on and and we caught up at the start of this year again. Um and um he, you know, we put it back on the table and and um 
I said, well, if we're going to do it, you know, we've got to stop saying let's do it. And it rolls on to another month and nothing happens. I said, well, look, let's just do it. Um, and it, let's just see what happens. Let's, let's go out. You come out with me video, um, <clears throat> one episode, um, of a hunt and you know, whether or not we get anything or not, let's just piece it together, see how it goes, see what you think. Um, and you know, then we can sort of really make a decision on whether or not, you know, this is going to be worthwhile or not. Um, so we went out, went out in the Rohini's and, and, um, we didn't end up getting anything that day. Uh, he brought along his colleague, um, and you know, the three of us, we walked up rivers, we walked up bush tracks and, you know, he had camera gear all over the show. Um, but he loved it. Uh, absolutely loved it. And, um, he fell in love straight away with, you know, why I'm so passionate about the outdoors and hunting and things like that. He, you know, he's a city guy. He's come from the UK. He's never had any hunting experience before. Um, and instantly he just clicked. He understood it straight away. He understood why I was, um, you know, getting out in the outdoors, you know, most weekends and, and, and why there was just this, you know, awe of, um, you know, amazement as soon as you step out of the ute and, and, you know, step into the bush or down into a river. Um, he, he just literally, why well, he was speechless for a while. Um, and then uh, we got back to the U and he said, yep, yeah, now we're doing this uh, and we're going to do it 100%. Uh, we're going to make it look awesome. Um, and yeah, there's no buts about it. <laughs> so, I, so I said, okay, well, it looks like we're locked in then. <laughs> um, so he went away and edited that, just that small bit of video and sent it to me. And I was like, holy heck, I wasn't expecting that to come back like that. And um and I said, okay, well, maybe we need to meet again and, and really work out a plan here and, and, you know, where to from here. And, um, and so, yeah, we, we met and we worked out a bit of a plan and, and I guess, you know, we, we really wanted to, um, highlight what our purpose was, um, you know, what our point of difference was, um, and, and ensure that, um, you know, what we were doing, it was going to be spot on and, and, um, you know, it was going to appeal to most people that, you know, either watch it or, or, or follow us. So, um, so yeah, once we sort of established that, then we, then we, um, you know, we, we, we started getting stuck into, um, doing a bit of videoing and, and a bit of planning and, and, um, getting out there really. Um, but yeah, I mean, Rob, he's, he's a great guy. He's, he's very good at what he does. Um, you know, he's got a couple of other colleagues that we can utilize as well, um, uh, for, for camera work. Um, I've just got a mate on board as well. Um, Dingo, he's, um, he's pretty keen on, on camera work and, and, um, you know, drone work as well. So we've got a pretty cool team that specialize in different areas, which is quite nice. So, um, but yeah, they've all got pretty hefty camera, camera gear. And, and, uh, for me it was, uh, yeah, it was a pretty new experience going out hunting, having a whole lot of cameras on you and, um, and, uh, and I mean, you get used to it pretty quickly. I, I guess the thing that I that I mentioned to the guys with um, you know videoing while we're out there is, um, you know, I want it to be as natural as possible, um, and I don't want it to be too staged um, because otherwise it, you just get caught up in videoing, and and the whole purpose is actually out there enjoying the the hunt and, and the journey from you know the time your alarm goes off to the time you you get back and and have a shower and have a cold beer you know it's i don't want it to be so oh can you walk back up that hill again because i missed that shot it's like I'm, I'm not into that it's like if you missed it then you missed it then you know you're gonna have to wait <laughs> um because we're out here to hunt first and foremost and second um comes the camera work and all the videography so um you guys need to be on your game because I'm out here to hunt and, um, <laughs> and, and you guys are going to capture it. Yeah. I'll do a bit of presenting. Um, but first and foremost, it's about the whole hunt and the, and the journey and the, and the excitement that that brings. Um, so yeah, we, we've, we've, um, you know, very quickly we've been able to establish a pretty cool team and, um, you know, we we've been able to engage in a lot of people who are interested in what we're doing, which is quite cool. And, you know, we just want to, I guess showcase something different um, and 
give people the enjoyment and satisfaction of um, you know what we're doing, which is you know providing free range organic meat um, for the use of of cooking amazing meals really um, so yeah we're pretty we're, we're all very passionate about it um, you know straight after work today I had Rob on the phone for about an hour he was where are we going next and what are we doing and all this kind of thing so it's really cool to have people you know just as passionate about what we're trying to achieve and what we're wanting to do uh, than just me. Nice. And so we, we need to just sort of build up the confidence to um, get your, your face and voice in front of a camera because I, I watched, yeah, yeah, I watched I was, your second episode first at, from, from Fiji and you were you're so fluent in front of the camera. Where, where's, where's your training for that come from? <laughs> yeah, it's funny actually because yeah, um, in my line of work, we do quite a bit of stuff, um, you know, in front of the camera. Um, and uh, yeah, it's sort of, it's one of those things that, you, you sort of get used to fairly quickly. Um, it, it takes a little bit of time to start with. I mean, in this instance here, it's a bit, it's a bit tricky compared to, you know, the sort of videos that are, that I end up creating for work. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, Rob's awesome. He, he guides you through certain things and, 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 you know, the other guys as well, they, they really, and, and I guess it's good because for like, for me, well, I know how things may play out but they might not um and so that's where they really ask the questions and then you know once i hear them ask the question then i know i have to really explain it in depth because the people that are actually going to be viewing this might not understand it as well um so that's where i just go into a little bit more depth and and you know you, you can get really excited about it sometimes and um you know, and then and then you sort of lose focus because you're talking too much to the camera and you're not focusing on hunting. So it's a bit of a balancing act, but um, but yeah, it's it's one of those things. Look, yeah, the more you do it, um, probably the more confident you get in it. Um, and you know, if you've got some awesome people around you, like we we've in the short space of time that we've been videoing some of the some of the stuff that you know, it's been a bit of a laugh as well. Um, you know, there's been some pretty funny moments that have happened. Um, and, um, you know, that, I guess that's what makes it as well. You know, you don't want to be too serious and through it all, but, um, you know, we know when we, we have to sort of get stuck in and, and, um, produce some good stuff because I mean, that's what people want. They want, they want to be able to see, um, quality. Um, and, um, you know, that for me, that's what I want to be able to produce is quality stuff that people you know, really say, wow, you know, that's really different to, to this or, or that, or, um, you know, really enjoyed that or, um, you know, what they're doing is, is amazing. So, so yeah. Yeah. And if the, uh, the boys need a little bit of motivation for carrying around those big cameras, you should send them to uh, <laughs> the Hunter, Hunters Club if, uh, season one, fueled on the episode, oh. which I've watched, I think four or five times a day carrying that massive, camera up oh, there. I just could not believe it <laughs> he's, he's a um Davis legion eh? um he's um you know I don't know him personally but I mean he does some pretty cool stuff and um you know like I said earlier you know with with some, some of the quality of I mean they've they set the benchmark really you know them and NZ Hunter Adventures you know they set the benchmark in terms of um you know putting New Zealand on that map really for um, hunting. I mean, you know, their, their videos and, and the episodes are probably seen globally and, and it really does showcase us in a, in a pretty awesome way. And, um, you know, the footage that they're able to shoot is um, pretty spectacular. And, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's one of those things where, um, you know, the guys in front of the camera probably people think that they've got the hard job but for me I think it's the guy you know shooting the footage that probably has the hardest job because he's got to be on point he can't miss that shot he's he's you know the hunter's like get over here get over here and you've got to be right there and 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 so it's um yeah it's it's probably more more harder for them than than anyone else sorry I was gonna plug my laptop in it's chewing through the battery <laughs> yeah mate and, and i guess their job as well is to try to get the emotion uh, across the line and across the camera and, and 
yeah, another one who's sort of set the benchmark in terms of telling stories around around hunting. And there's plenty of them out there internationally, but one that was sort of closer to home was Pace Brothers, who who brought out their film just around the same time as the the Tar Cull sort of thing went ahead, and they they followed Joseph Peter through the Southern Alps and hear the emotion of, of seeing those magnificent beasts on the on the hill and, and harvesting one of them. It, it's that is, yeah, like I say, oh. the art the art is in where it's captured in those in those shots and angles and, and you're right, you're you're just there to hunt, but yeah. the other one that's gonna to try to communicate the story. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just I don't know, the they any camera guy who's who's doing a bit of videoing hunting um you know they they've got a pretty tough job and um you know those guys on those episodes you know they've uh yeah i mean they they do some fantastic stuff and you know you, you'd love to see the hard work that they put in it behind the scenes as well you know the stuff that we don't see and and the amount of hours um you know sort of a, a 40 year 50 minute show that's compressed in, you know, from 10 days, um, you know, the amount of energy and, and time that it takes, um, you know, to, to produce that is, um, is pretty cool. Yeah. It's always good to see NZ Hunter showing, showing, um, the boys in, in the editing room sitting, sitting there in the middle of summer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that, and that's good though. You know, the people want to see that kind of stuff because it's sort of like, you don't, you don't see, you know, what goes on outside of, of the hunt, you know, what Willie and, and Greg do outside of, you know, the episodes and, um, you know, it'd be awesome to see, um, more of that, I reckon. Absolutely. Mate, yeah, as you said, your, your computer's nearly dying and, and, and it's getting later on and we've had a fantastic chat. Where do people find you and, and Bob Meat Hunter? Because um, I'd urge them to get, get along and, and get involved and, and follow it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're, you know, we'd love people to, to follow us and, and, and uh, join us on our journey. Um, we're, we're on Facebook and, and Instagram, and we've just started a YouTube channel as well. So, look, we'll be posting videos and, and content and uh, photos, you know. Um, for people to to enjoy and, and follow and look we'd love feedback as well um you know i really want to engage with people in terms of the cooking side of things as well and, and get people's um, ideas around um you know how they prepare and cook wild wild meat as well because uh it'd, it'd be nice to um hear some um quirky sort of ways of of, of preparing things and um you know i've had many of uh, messages already which you know for me it's like wow you know I really want to try that now um, so it gives me the motivation to get out there and and um, you know try new things and and uh, you know I guess create something different for people to enjoy so uh, yeah follow us on Facebook and Instagram and um, and check out our, our videos on YouTube as well nice and I'll have all of them in the show notes so people don't need to look very far um, mate what would you like to leave us with whether it's a question for everybody as you said you like some feedback or, or just a thought some thoughts or things that you're sort of living your life by well I've, I've got a question for you Ron um, yeah, to, to end yeah. what, what is your favourite wild meat recipe hmm so we uh, maximise the mints um, oh yep Especially venison mince. So, Eleanor Ozich has a cookbook called My Family Table, and in there there's a lamb ragu recipe that combines. Um, so you cook down red onions or shallots. Um, you add sort of mint and chili, and that might be about it. Then you chuck in the mince, cook that down, add some Worcester sauce, red wine, reduce that. I always put a little bit of stock in there as well. And then it's tomatoes, which you let it simmer and you have that on a nice golden cumin bed with plenty of, oh, uh, pre plenty of parmesan and, and, and parsley on top. So that's how, that's what nice. I like to do with my venison mince, the, the stuff that, you know, it's not the glory, glory cuts, but they're the, the mince. It's it's the unsung sort of cut of meat, isn't it really? It's the hearty <laughs> stuff that, uh, that feeds, uh, keeps us nice and warm inside. Yeah, and what would yours be then? Oh, look, I've um, just started getting into uh, my venison shanks and yes. um, slow cooking those uh, over a period of time. Um, I used to uh, 
stupidly cut away the the meat around the shank and, and use them for you know other sorts of things like mints um but yeah i've you know decided to uh, utilize them and um yeah slow cooker and i love love cooking things on the slow cooker coming home uh at the end of a day and and smelling all those mm. amazing smells when you walk in the door um you know it's just awesome but yeah venison shanks for me is is up there with uh yeah, one of the faves. Yeah, and I, and I heard on a podcast, Peter Atia, he's just got into bow hunting. He, he got an axis and he um, did a stew with heart. Uh, he said he put oh, three, nice. three hearts in the stew and obviously all the sinews and stuff just melt away and apparently it's fantastic. So there's another one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> try it, yeah, nice, definitely. And jerky. Jerky is, uh, you know, um, I'm sort of got a mate who's uh, just set up um, to do some uh, jerky. So we're, uh, yeah, Hopefully, if we can get out this weekend and, and get a few, get a bit of meat, we're um, yeah going to experiment with some different spices and, and uh, getting some venison jerky. So uh, I'll have to send you some over. Oh, be much appreciated. Sweet. I'll press uh, stop on this. And um, yeah, awesome. Thanks very much. Awesome, mate. It was a great chat. And uh, yeah, keep in touch next time you're over in the metal too or, or whatever. I'll give you a bell and uh, yeah, we'll go out for a hunt. Absolutely.